you all uh, welcome. And thank you for joining us uh, today for AMCA's annual Orchid Day, October 28th, 1940, commemoration. The, stu the struggle for all has begun. Nin, Iper, Panton, or Agon. Here, here we are at the Free West Club. We haven't been here, obviously, for a couple of years. I mean, the last time we did the Sochi Day event live was two years ago before COVID hit. So uh, it's really great to see you uh, again uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this great hall. This particular event is, uh, is a, uh, sponsored by, uh, by EMCA, and it's an association with the Dimitris Kontos Memorial Lecture Series. I have this Hellenic Cultural Commission. Uh, I have a Delphi Chapter 25, and I have, and I have Empire, Empire State District 6. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Lou Katsos. I'm Emka's president and founder, and the uh, I have a National Hellenic Cultural Commission chairman. Orchid Day is a national Hellenic holiday and represents when the Hellenic Prime Minister Metaxas was awoken to respond to a series of demands from a representative at the time, fascist Italy, which would have allowed foreign troops free reign in Greece, a neutral country at the time. When the Italian ambassador, Emmanuel Grazzi, visited Metaxas residence and presented those demands on the night of October 28, 1940, and that was at 3 a.m. in the morning, by the way, Metaxas curtly replied in French, and I'm not going to do the French, then it is war, is what his response was. His response to, this, to these demands and the Hellenic public's Orchi, no. Remember that Metaxas, because some people confuse, they think Metaxas said no to Grazi. He didn't say no. It was the people in Greece who said no, and it was in the newspapers that the word Orchi appeared, and that's how we get basically the name uh, Orchi and Orchi Day. This Orchi led to uh, historic battles by the Hellenes against the fascists, which had international consequences for Europe and the free world. It was the first time, the first time in the European theater that a fascist Axis power was defeated after taking over country after country after country. I think there were about 13 nations that were taken over be before this particular event. And it galvanized all of Europe with the thought that the fascist Axis powers could be defeated. Hellenic heroism raised the hopes of occupied Europe and caused the Nazi forces which were scheduled to attack the Soviet Union under what they called Operation Barbarossa to divert their forces and invade on Elas instead. So I think they started in late October uh, there was fighting, obviously, for about six months, uh, you know, back and forth. Originally, they invaded, you know, uh, um, uh, Greece through Epidos. The Greek forces pushed them back into, into Albania. They had actually taken over about 25% of Albania. And then uh, around April, around April of uh, 41, is when, is when, in fact, the Nazi forces decided to divert and come into, come into Greece. I just want to give that background because it's important for those who may not understand what Orchidea is all about. This diversion, uh, which led to the delay of the, of, the, of the Nazi invasion of the USSR and the Nazis' eventual defeat there in the Soviet Union, was a major event in World War, World War II. So when we think of Orchidea, do not think of it just as a, as a Hellenic national holiday. It's an event that, that quite frankly, should be celebrated throughout Europe and throughout the world because psychologically it affected all of Europe during that particular time. And as I said, because the Nazi forces were diverted from attacking the uh, USSR at the time, it led to, a, to the eventual wiping out in, in many ways of, of the Nazi forces within the USSR and, and led to also the defeat of the, of the Axis powers. Orchid Day was a turning point and has stated uh, international in scope and importance, again, beyond the Hellenic Republic. Many times we talk about events like the revolution, the Greek revolution, and, and we just think of it as a Greek event. But in fact, 
Also, the, the revolution was an international event at the time and had tremendous importance in the United States, as we say, because it also affected the abolitionist movement in the US post-revolution, and it affected also the women's suffrage movement. A different topic, and you could look that up on YouTube under EMBCA, because we've had those panel discussions. In addition to the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, uh, eventual defeat of, of, uh, of Alas, who fought long and hard, the bravery, the bravery, which you'll, which you'll understand in some of these discussions that, and present, uh, presentations that will be here, that bravery of the Hellenic people during those difficult six months also had the effect of changing how Hellenic Americans were perceived in America, and also Hellenes around the world, by the way. Uh, it transformed, it transformed how we were thought of. Because it, be, prior to Ochide, many people don't realize this, prior to Ochide, we were like the other in the United States of America. But that bravery, which we'll get out of these discussions, galvanized everyone. And certainly, uh, as Steve is going to talk about what was taking place in the newspapers in the United States, but that's representative not only of the newspapers in the United States, what was going on while these battles were taking place, but throughout the world, throughout the world in terms of the, of the media of the time. And finally, like I said, in this great land of the United States, we were finally recognized as, uh, as Americans. The lecture today will include presentations by historian, researcher, uh, author Peter Yakumis on American news coverage on Orchidea, historian, artist uh, Vasilios uh, Krisokos on Orchidea, the cultural impact on Alas and the world, and Marsha Nikonomopoulos, the museum director of Kehila, Kadosha Yanina on May Their Memory Be a Blessing, Greek Jews Who Fell in Battle on the Albanian Front. Now we, uh, I want to introduce uh, someone that, uh, that we all know. He's a member of uh, Delphi uh, 25, I have a Delphi 25, which is my, was my chapter of a half of Akosas Tsurakis to sing the Hellenic National Anthem. absolute impartiality towards all. Italy denied us the right to live the life of free Hellenes, demanding from me at six o'clock this morning the surrender of portions of the national territory to be chosen by herself and informed me that her troops would move forward at 6 p.m. in order to take possession. I replied to the Italian minister that I considered both the demand itself and the manner of its delivery, of delivery as a declaration of war on the part of Italy against Greece. It is now for us to show whether or we, we are indeed worthy of our ancestors and of the freedom won by us by our forefathers. Let the entire nation rise as one man. Fight for your country 
your wives, your children, and our sacred traditions. The struggle for all has begun. Nin Iper Panton Awan. By the way, he, uh, he stated at six o'clock, they said they were invaded, they invaded at 5.30. So they even lied in that particular, in that particular case. Uh, I'd like now, before we start the presentations, to, uh, to have some honored guests who are with us uh, today uh, to have a few remarks. We'll start with, um, with uh, Dr. Kostantinos uh, uh, Kutras, who's the uh, Hellenic Republic Council General in New York. Dr. Kutras. Θα πω δύο λόγια στα ελληνικά πριν ξεκινήσω. Γιατί για μένα η σημερινή εκδήλωση Λου έχει έναν, πέρα από την ημέρα, έχει και μια συναισθηματική φόρτιση, διότι πριν από πέντε χρόνια στον καθεδρικό ναό ήταν η πρώτη μου εκδήλωση που κάναμε ε, και ήταν τότε που γνώρισα την αγαπημένη μου Κάρολ. Και δεν ξέρω όσοι είστε εσεί, τότε είχε συμβεί ένα περιστατικό το οποίο είμαι περήφανο να σου πω την γιατί. Έβαλα τα κλάματα εκεί γιατί παρόλο που δεν ήξερα τον Δημήτρη Κόντο, μου θύμιζε τόσα πολλά από τον πατέρα μου που τον είχα χάσει και εγώ πολύ νέο. Και πραγματικά ήταν μια ανθρώπινη στιγμή την οποία θυμάμαι με πάρα πολύ μεγάλη αγάπη. Κάρα σε αγαπώ, Τζίμι. Today, in the morning, early in the morning, as I was reading the newspapers, I found an article in Financial Times Group under the title, The Greeks and the Greek Revolution, The World's Debt. At the beginning of the article, I quote, and I will read three lines, but the, it is talking about the poem, but the preface of the poem contains the most, the most powerful summary in the English language of the debt that Western civilization owes to the ancient Greeks. We are all Greeks, said they all. Our laws, our literature, our religion, our arts have their roots in Greece. More than 150 years later, French President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing made the same point when he issued a passionate plea for Greece newly liberated from military dictatorship to be brought into the European economic community at that time, later the European Union. And Valerius uh, Kardestan was asking, what is Europe without Plato? You can imagine. So I found that article today interesting and I would like to share it with you. I made the, uh, the same comment today at St. Demetrius School in Astoria, where hundreds of young kids, the new generation, which will, we will embrace all of us, we have to do that in order to, to pass the torch to the new generation. Today is a special day for us. 81 years since the day of our orgy against both the fascist and later the Nazi aggression. That very day, the Greek people, as you said, Lou, stood firm against those who wished to preserve our sovereignty and proved with their heroic struggle what was already known since antiquity, that the Hellenes will never surrender <coughs> our freedom, our liberty, and our country to anyone. That uh, while we are, the Greeks, a peace loving nation, we will always protect our independence. That we will never surrender to injustice. We ought to remember and honor them all. The Hellenic army, who fought with all its might from October 28th, when Colonel Mordechai Frizis repelled that the fascist aggressors until the very end of the war. The Greek people, who never surrendered to the Nazis, no matter the repercussions. Archbishop Tavaskinos, who in the darkest hours of Greece, stood his ground against the occupants 
and save hundreds of our Jewish compatriots. And of course, all those who perished because of the Nazis' atrocities. 81 years after the war, Greece, our country, despite the many setbacks we all know, is looking forward, is looking towards the future with optimism. Its conscious choice to be a member of the West solidified back then with its participation in the Allied camp. This move is reflected in our role today in the international system. Greece is a core NATO member that guarantees regional security and stability and unequivocally respects international law and the UN Charter. Ladies and gentlemen, I mention that because unlike others who back in World War II were precarious neutrals, you know what I mean, Ruben, and today are precarious allies in, uh, in NATO, our participation in the transatlantic alliance and our close relations with the US United States of America are not an opportunistic choice. Rather, they are a principled one. I would also like to think how far Greece has advanced thanks to the heroic sacrifice of our nation back in the World War II. This acknowledgement, of course, comes with a heavy duty. We must inherit to the future generation an even more stronger and stable world. From our part, I am pleased to note that our country, Greece, has been taking the appropriate steps so far. The fact, the fact that we have been effectively handling the pandemic first, while at the same time the country implemented a series of much needed reforms in the field of digital technologies, taxation, investments, etc. This proves that as a country, not only we overcome any challenge, but we are able to bounce back even stronger. However, you do know, you are aware, that we are facing new challenges today. Terrorism, hybrid threats, pandemics, climate change, just many of you. This proves all the more that we must all stay alert and vigilant. The answer does not lie in isolation, but in cooperation under common principles and values, as is the case with the United States-Greek relations, or our relations with Israel, with France, with Egypt, with the United Arab Emirates, just to name a few countries. This is what the Western world has always stood for and will continue to do so. And of course, we must continue honoring the great sacrifices of the Hellenic nation. How? By continuing to stand for what we have traditionally stood for, for Hellenic blue worldwide, in Cyprus, in Greece, in Constantinople, in the United States of America, in Australia, everywhere. To stand for religious freedoms and human rights, for peace, prosperity, and above all, for international legality. Of course, you, the Greek diaspora, the distinguished members of the Greek diaspora, have always played a significant role in the defense of those principles. Today, we go in silence and respect in the memory of those who fought for freedom and those who rose up against tyranny. But there is only one way to keep up with their legacy, by never taking peace and democracy for granted. We must safeguard them at all costs. And of course, we must never forget that the policy of the Abyssinian faith 
our resolve and firm belief in what we stand for is the best answer to all those who wish to bring back our world in its more obscure past. With these words, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to say one more word in Greek. Zito Elas, Zito Pedro. President of the United States was a member of Delphi Chapter 25, and that uh, he became a member from 1931 when he was the governor of uh, New York State, and remained and remained a member of AHPA until he died in uh, in 1945. Also, I would be remiss uh, not to mention uh, some of the things that AHPA, AHPA has done or did during that, that terrible period that uh, after Rocky Day and the six months where, we, where Greece was occupied by, by the Nazi forces, the Italian forces, and the Bulgarian forces, because Greece was divided by those three, three countries in terms of um, what they had. But I'm not going to make all the comments about it, but because I'll leave it. No, no because I'll leave, I'll leave it to others. I'll leave it to others. But I will, I will say another thing, that, that during the aftermath of what we're talking about right now, a few hundred thousand people died of hunger in Greece. Over 300,000 people actually died of hunger. Because a lot of the resources of the country were taken by, by the Nazi troops and the other troops that were there. And one thing that's not mentioned enough, but I'll mention it, uh, I have this role in that particular thing, uh, for bringing food actually into Greece while it was occupied. And, and the and some of the people who helped, whether it was Spanos, okay, who was who was in, uh, you know, the famous Spanos, the the, uh, the film uh, uh, film man, um, and he did, and they did it in a very interesting way. What they did was they couldn't obviously send American ships into Greece. Uh, what they did was they, they funneled the money through Turkey and had Turkish ships actually bring food into Greece. And they saved uh, tens of thousands of people. So I think that should be mentioned. I have, I have a. A great uh, honor to uh, uh, to introduce uh, the Supreme President of Ahapa, Jimmy Kopatas, who, who we all know. He's a native. He's a native of New York, and many of us who are sitting here obviously attended the uh, biennial, the 45th biennial um, congressional congressional banquet in Washington on Sunday. Jimmy Kopatas. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lou for once again putting this together for the whole lecture series that you've done in the past. Uh, Brother Lou has done an outstanding job as the chairman of the Hellenic Cultural Commission. He's brought a new perspective, a new zeal to it, and uh, re-energized us all. Thank you, Dr. Kutras, for those uh, very informing and motivating words. You have been a great support of ours as well, and we appreciate it. Now, Lou's got all the facts. Okay, so I'm, I can't go into that. I'm not going to question the professor. He knows all the statistics and everything else. Our organization was founded in 1922 to help the Greeks that were being discriminated against. Obviously, we're talking here 18 years later, and like Lou said, uh, the Greeks' actions definitely changed the opinion of this country and the opinion of the world that did not think too highly of us possibly before and thought that we were just a country that gave democracy to the world, uh, medicine and science, and then kind of took a hiatus. We did change the world. We changed the, the, the world greatly. It's difficult if I said to somebody in this room today that you're gonna go outside, suffer greatly, and probably never see the benefit of it. But your children and grandchildren probably will, and the world will. We don't have too many people that would voluntarily take, voluntarily take that, that beating today. Uh, and I think that's one of the things we need to kind of think about. The Greeks were only about 120 years removed from the revolution. So everybody that fought, probably their parents, grandparents, Pass down the stories because they lived it. 
in those 120 years. I, help, I have helped a lot during that time. There were heavens that fought, some of Pericles that were of a fighting age that fought. Um, the same Greeks that were questioned as to their citizenship and their belonging in this country sold $350 million of war bonds. I forget what the cost of the war was, and I couldn't verify this, but I think it might have been $7 billion, somebody had said. I could be off. And we sold 350, so 1 20th of the cost of the war the Greeks sold. No other civic organization sold as many war bonds, by the way, and they received uh, a status from, from the government that nobody else received either. So I think we kind of proved ourselves uh, in this country and, and our love for it. But more importantly, we proved that we were principled, disciplined, honorable people that were willing to risk it all because we were not going to throw away what our ancestors fought for and just to regain that freedom 120 years prior. That's the passion that I hope we're getting across to the, to the youth. That everything that we've got today, somebody paid a significant price for. If we're fortunate, it hasn't been us. If we're fortunate, it hasn't been our parents or our grandparents. Uh, but most likely, for us as Greeks, it has been. Whether we had somebody pass in the war, or as Lou said, people starved. There were tremendous consequence to the war, tremendous financial consequence. And then after that, we went into the Greek Civil War. So it continued. But the war brought us together, and I think galvanized the people to... Greece was not a great place at the time politically. There were a lot of different things going on in Greece, and, and it was split. And this brought people together and gave them a common cause and common union. Uh, deeper than at other times because it challenged their soul. It challenged their existence. Many other countries said yes to the, uh, to the Axis. Just the way many other countries today look the other way when something is, is wrong. And to those countries, I guess they don't realize the consequence, or they choose not to realize the consequence, and not want to acknowledge the consequence. We, we saw the consequence, and even today as a country, we still stand up as a small country that we are, but we are united, we, and we are principled. We still stand up for what's right. We still stand up for religious freedoms of other countries because we've been through it. We've been enslaved in our own country. We haven't been able to practice our faith to a certain extent during those almost 400 years of occupation. And we must keep the history alive. If we do not keep the history alive, somebody else will either change it or keep their history more relevant. And to be honest with you, this day does not get the mention that it should. It does not get the attention it should because it did change the history of, of the war. It did change the history of the country and the world. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Battle of Crete with my father-in-law being a critical and what happened there. But it happened throughout a lot of Greece. Pitchforks, hammers, shovels, whatever people could fight for. I think we lost, was it 330, 350,000 people? Something like that. Terrible terrible consequences. But nobody thought about the consequences the same way they didn't think about the consequences during the almost 400 years. Our children and our grandchildren need to be made aware and need, the greatest gift that we can give them besides their faith is the zeal that they are Greek and they are American. You don't want them to grow up and not feel that. We're fortunate again, because this is only 80 years removed. So the way that my father told stories and grandfather told stories, those are stories coming directly from people that lived it. So let's do all that we can to bring attention to this. Let's hope that maybe one day the United States will do a better job of accepting this day as a, as a possible holiday. You never know. But if we don't keep it alive, it'll certainly never have a chance to get there. So please continue to stand up for what's right. We never know what the consequence is when people turn their backs. 
as a smaller country that's constantly picked on to a certain extent by a certain other countries. Other countries need to acknowledge that because they don't know if they'll be the countries picked on tomorrow. Uh, good people need to find a way to come together. No matter what our ethnic backgrounds are, no matter what our religions are, the bad voices and the bad characters of the world seem that they keep getting louder and louder and somehow always pull the microphone to them. When we, as trying to be good and just people, shy away from the microphone because we know that we're looking for, for God's stamp of approval, not for the public or the people's stamp of approval. But the bad people like the bully pulpit, and they're able to get that across. So as Dr. Kutra said, Greece, Cyprus, Israel, Syria, what's going on over there, persecution, executions in Afghanistan, trying to stand for what's right, even though we're not asked to go to war, we're not asked to fight, express your opinion, be honest, and stand for the just. Because if our ancestors didn't stand for the just with a greater price to pay than we have just saying it, uh, we would not be here today with the liberties and freedoms that we do. Zito elada, zito emeriki, ke zito i psichi, afternoon, pokasam. Thank you very much. Jimmy mentioned uh, Crete. Uh, support. Uh, Crete was the last uh, part of Greece that fell. It, it fell basically uh, towards, the end of, towards the end of May, like I said. Uh, the Germans came in, uh, started to come in about April 6th of 41. Uh, you know, by the end of April, they had, they had taken over most of the Peloponnese all the way to the south. Uh, and Kalamata was the last uh, city to fall, actually, during that time period. And, and May was the, the, final, the final battles that took place. There was so much, so much um, involvement by the people of Crete in terms of the paratroopers landing on Crete and the deaths that took place by people with knives, pitchforks, etc., who were fighting the Germans that, um, that Hitler, after the Battle of Crete, never used paratroopers again in World War II. You know, people should know that. In terms of the, uh, you know, I hate, you know, you guys mentioned certain dates, all, all, you know, certain other things come to mind. You mentioned 120 years, uh, you know, from, from the time of the revolution to the time, you know, to the time of, uh, of Orchidee. But again, just putting this all together, um, also, there was Company 122, uh, an infantry battalion in the United States that was formed by, uh, by the order of uh, President uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And it was a battalion that was made of Greek Americans. And uh, basically, it's a, it's a storied battalion. Uh, many of them went into Greece during the, uh, during the uh, time period it was occupied in all types of, all types of amazing things within a country uh, fighting the forces in, internally. And I think that also has to be mentioned. We should look at Orchidee in a, in, to a certain degree, sort of like the Battle of Thermopylae. Even though, even though we lost in the end, okay, we won in the end. And uh, the Battle of Thermopylae, uh, obviously, uh, you know, we're talking about 81 years since, uh, since, uh, since Orchidee. The Battle of Thermopylae is 2,501 years, because last year was the 2,500th anniversary. So I wanted to mention some of those dates. Uh, the next person I'm going to introduce, I have, I have a warm feeling just like, uh, just like Dr. Dr. Putras has, because for years, for years, we would go to the Holy Trinity uh, during this time period of Orchid Day. Uh, we would have usually a reception at the Hellenic Council, uh, Consulate, and then we would go uh, to the Holy Trinity uh, to, to have um, the lecture series, the Dimitris Contos uh, Memorial Lecture Series. And when we, when we started to do this again, I thought it was very important that that particular lecture series is not forgotten. So I want to make sure that everyone understands that this is also a Dimitris Contos uh, you know, uh, Memorial Lecture Series. 
I'd like to introduce uh, Carol Pontus uh, on behalf of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Memorial Lecture Series. We love her. We love her tremendously. She's done a, a lot. The family has done a lot for the church. Thank you. my group here tonight in your family. Thank you. I want to start by making a confession. My family and I have a secret love. And his name is Consul General Costis Gutras and Popita, of course. He's one of the nicest, the family, the nicest people I know, the nicest Greeks I've met in a very long time. And thank you for your kind words also, Costi. The feelings are mutual, my dear. Uh, let me begin. I'm not going to make too many comments. I know you all want to hear the presenters. Just let me begin by saying thank you for being here. I see many old friends and some new ones that it's nice to meet. Uh, again, thank you to the group. Thank you for attending tonight. And um, all I can say is that I started this lecture series to sort of honor the memory of a man who was very Greek in his heart and soul. We lived in New York. We were married here. My husband's business was here. We raised our children here. He loved America. My husband loved America very much. It was his adopted country. But his heart and his soul were Greek. And uh, he always supported Greek ideas, Greek religion, our Greek church, our Greek schools. He was an avid speaker of Greek uh, in groups wherever we were. So I thought it might be a nice time, this time of year, because it was his name day, name day time of year. He loved the end of October. Uh, I thought this was a good time to begin the lecture series. So I did it actually 16 years ago. And I was, I, I'm very pleased that many of you still remember and you come to honor him, his memory. And thanks again to Lou for including me. Welcome, and now I give the microphone to the presenters whom I thank for being here so they can do their share tonight. Thank you. Thank you. He's a renowned Hellenic American bass baritone. He has performed throughout the United States and throughout the world. And he has appeared in Germany in the title role of Mozart's Don Giovanni and many other roles, uh, more recently in the States. And as we mentioned, he sang, uh, for example, this past Sunday. And it was uh, really great, uh, great, great to hear you, always, always. Uh, he is a dedicated music educator who regularly teaches young musicians and is the associate music director at the Archdiocesan Cathedral of the Holy Trinity. He follows in the uh, footsteps of many of uh, his family before him, and he's a proud Ahepa member of Delphi Chapter 25. Mestus dromus trirnane, i manades que quitane, nandi crisune. Ta pedia tus porquistican, sto stat modan horistican, nani quisune. Maia quinus pufun figi, que idoxa tus tiligi, ascheromaste. Que pote camas mis clapsi, cate polo tis ascapsi. Oh, Master, oh, 
So October 14th to 27th was a sample that I took. And from those dates, I decided to just choose a few selected, hand-selected examples of what Americans knew or were knowing or were uh, enlightened through the media, as well as the Greek Americans that were living here. So what the Greeks knew and what was going on in Greece as they lived it is one thing, but what was it for those here in the United States as we make our way to October 28th? And I think you are going to be surprised at what was known here. So my first choice was October 14th. From the Lowell Sun, 1940, if you notice, that there is a map. The map is quite explicit. Balkans fear wars spread. Turks foresaw three possible German advances indicated by arrows towards Egypt. Obviously, their concern was that Hitler may turn to an invasion of Turkey. But it's clear to see that the longest of the arrows in that map is the route that the Axis powers would ultimately take if this were to come to fruition. So that is 1940, October 14th, which was a Monday, in the Lowell newspaper. So people are becoming aware that there is an impending doom. Follow that, we have another choice, another selection, October 15th of 1940. Greece called up more of 1940 class. Athens, October 15th. The second half of the 1940 class of conscripts will be called up tomorrow for regular military training. It was announced today. Subject to call are about 25,000 20 year olds. One of them was my grandfather, who was born in 1919. October 19th, Axis demands Greek concessions, the Daily Messenger. Within the article that follows that headline is something extremely interesting that was now known throughout the United States. There was a list of demands in writing Especially to the Cairo source is the following demands that were called for. There were five of them. Immediate severance of economic relations with Great Britain. Secession to Italy of a strip of territory adjacent to the southeastern Albanian border and secession to Bulgaria of a quarter to the Aegean Sea. Three. Permission for Italy to construct a road from Albania to Salonika, Greek port of the Aegean, and so-called key to the South Balkans. Use of certain Greek air bases by Germany and Italy. And fifth, abdication of King George II of Greece and resignation of premier dictator John Metaxas and formation of a pro-access government, all on October 19th, and was covered and carried in multiple newspapers. However, as we move forward in this time capsule, October 20th, the Sunday Star has something interesting. I quote, Greece is on the spot. Greece is certainly in a bad spot. If she should yield to Axis pressure, Britain would undoubtedly seize the numerous Greek islands and might even occupy the southern peninsula of the Peloponnese. On the other hand, if Greece resists the Axis powers, plus Bulgaria, it is more than doubtful whether even the aid of the British fleet and an expeditionary force could long stave off military occupation of the mainland by Axis armies. 
in either event, Greece would be devastated. So if the newspapers that the common man is reading, obviously this was known by the powers, making the decision that they did on October 28th even more profound. On October 22nd, Tuesday, headline, Aegean Islands hold key to new Balkan war move. Effective aid could be given to the Greeks in resisting an Italian march into Greek territory, but was in doubt. October 26th, the Evening Star, Washington DC, Saturday, front page, headline, new Italian drive is near in Egypt, Rome Radio says. Suspension of airline service to Greece also indicates move. By the Associated Press Rome, October 26, the Rome radio said today, a new Italian offensive in Egypt was imminent. While sudden suspension of Italian air service to Greece caused foreign observers to wonder if a showdown with the little nation was not also on the immediate schedule. So by the 27th of October, 1940, the Sunday Star, Washington DC, the daily evening edition on the front page, armed Greek bands fought off by Albanians, Italy charges. Soldiers attacked border outposts Rome announces. It was believed that fighting might lead to the dispatch of an Italian punitive expedition to avenge the Albanians and to fulfill their demands for Greek territory. Such an action also would be in pursuit of the Axis aim to drive British influence out of the Southern Europe. Albania has been a part of the fascist empire since its seizure by Italian troops on Good Friday of 1939. And that is the end of that article on that day. And so the stage is set. On October 27, 1940, history is about to be made by the modern Greek nation. God bless the sacrifices of the brave Greek soldiers of 1940. God bless all of them that fought. God bless their sacrifice. Zito y Patrida. I, I apologize for making commentaries, but I, I'm going to be doing it throughout the, throughout the night. Um, there were actions taken by Italy uh, a year before October, October 28th. Uh, they were talking in Rome about what they were going to do. Many times in the newspapers, we read what people are saying they're going to do, and we don't listen to it, thinking that it's all you know, nonsense. But you have to listen to what the other party is saying all the time. In terms, in terms of Italy, uh, they did, in fact, uh, invade uh, Albania. They were involved in Italy for a long period of time. And as a matter of fact, the only reason why southern Italy, which was, we call, uh, part of Ipidos, Barrio Ipidos, after the Balkan Wars that, that, uh, that you write about, that was liberated during those Balkan Wars, they wanted enosis with Greece during, during the, after that, the Balkan Wars. The only reason, the only reason why they were not united with Greece has to do with Italy and uh, President Wilson at the time. That's, that's the only reason. In terms of Egypt, uh, Council General, that you, that you mentioned, I think it's important to note that once, once the uh, forces fell uh, within Greece, uh, the, the Greek government and many of the military forces actually went to Egypt, and that's where they established their base, so I think that's, that's very important to note. Our next presenter is Billy Kusokos. Uh, Billy uh, is a historical consultant who has given presentations on various Hellenic uh, theme subjects, such as the historical, historical significance of Archive Day, among others. 
He is the primary composer, historical consultant, and producer of Profilas, Anna and, and Vladimir, which debuted at the uh, Carnegie Hall and Off-Broadway. He has also worked on a TV documentary on World War I's Balkan Theater, and children's art, book on, uh, art books on Greek history and mythology. He is uh, an AHEPA member of District 6 and also the director of Hellenism of District 6 and the president of the AHEPA Hermes Chapter 186. He is the UNESCO Pidias New York Director of Modern Music, an awarded musical uh, video editor, and member of ASCAP. He majored in political science history with a minor in education from Queens College. His presentation is entitled Oichide, the cultural impact on a loss in the world. It's nice seeing everybody uh, live again. I know we've done a lot of Zoom uh, lectures and other presentations, but uh, it's wonderful seeing all, all your faces again and being here in the Free West Club. Uh, it's always, uh, it always kind of scares me being late in the, the, the bill uh, after so many speakers uh, when we're discussing a historical date and event because I fear everything will be covered by the time I come. But uh, <laughs> there are so many things uh, with Oki Day and, uh, and, uh, and this specific part of Greek history that really nobody knows. And um, when I started doing um, some presentations on Oki Day, uh, I also started inquiring like Pete has with my own family about um, you know our ancestry and, and things. What, what were my parents doing at that time? My grandparents and um, my mother is uh, from Calabria, Clitoria, That's in the Peloponnese, where after this event took place when the Nazis uh, conquered, uh, they burned the whole town down. The, the Calabria Holocaust, and actually were were survivors. So with that, I you know I tried to do more research and, and to find out more information about what led to this, uh, you know, to these events. So uh, I started doing a World War I documentary with uh, uh, a Greek um, uh, new uh, TV network. Um, hopefully if things go through, I'll, I'll be able to tell you more about that. But it's about the Balkan theater, and uh, because of those events and the national schism that occurred between the period of 1910 up until the late 1930s, uh, there is a reason why Greece was divided. Uh, you had the monarchists, the republicans, and the Venezuelists, uh, different sections of uh, the Greek uh, economic class and political class that lasted almost 30 years. And we have these, these, these events continue to this day in different forms that always keep us divided politically. So uh, it's good to understand that World War II is the combination of unfinished business from World War I. And Greece, along with Serbia, uh, stood in the way of Great Britain's and Germany's, uh, you know, game for world dominance. And we were, we were in the middle, as we were trying to resurrect from a little Greece, from the 1821 revolution, uh, to, to recreate some kind of a new Byzantium, a modern Byzantium. Uh, we stood in the way of Turkey, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Germany, and England. So, unfortunately, even though we won with Venizelos, uh, we had a lot of victories, uh, and Greece almost, uh, we, uh, more than five times the size, grew out of World War I. A lot of it became, became forgotten because we were not the big winners. We were not the French or the Germans or the British, uh, actually not the Germans, the British and the French, which were a lot of the history books at the time, you know, historical novels, uh, literature about the Western Front. So that's, that's one of the main reasons why a lot of this stuff is forgotten. Now, by the time we have uh, 1936, when Prime Minister of Texas uh, takes over, he is uh, becomes uh, he's given the reign from from the king to take over the country out of a period of anarchy. And that's why I have to mention World War One and the catastrophe of Smyrna of 1922 and those events, which afterwards, as Greece was trying to rebuild itself, it had a a lot of different governments. Even though it was, it was still a monarchy, it had many, probably like dozens or hundreds of governments. And uh, I mean, like every year it would switch. That's why people left. People went to the Auto America, to Australia, you know, Canada, and other places in, uh, in Europe. 
And uh, our families also came here because of these events from 1910 up until then. So the wisest thing the king did was give uh, a veteran of all these wars control and to reshape and rebuild the economy and the country itself. So I want to discuss a few things about it. There was a cultural impact of 28th of October when uh, Orchidea occurred. Uh, and as Lou has mentioned, on, on the Greece, alas, and the whole world. That's why it has to be remembered. This victory alone, unfortunately, became a loss afterwards. But it, you know, it wasn't like the Balkan Wars when we actually we won, and that became forgotten. Uh, it was still very important, and it made us very public. And it kept us in the public eye until probably the late 60s or 70s. And that is another reason we must not forget other famous Greek Americans, like the Scudas brothers, who ran Hollywood for a long time, and who made Greek oriented films, they kept us in the public eye. And when they retired, that is one of the reasons we kind of fell out of the public eye in America. So when you don't have movies being made, books being written, we're forgotten. But for this period, Greece had resurrected. And it was very important that people that fought had a long, long history, going thousands of years back. And every time I start this presentation, I like to mention you know, it, they were not some new race. They did not just pop out of nowhere. They had a big burden behind them, the, the Hellenic people. You know, ancient Greece, Hellenistic Greece, Byzantium, and then the 400 years of Turkish occupation, the revolution, going all the way to the World War II. So they were carrying a big load. They had so much mythology and history behind them, scientists, philosophers, uh, military leaders that they felt they would not be wiped out. They, they had, they had the, the pathos to survive. So against all odds, they survived the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, the genocides, and throughout the turbulent diff different governments and the national schism, uh, poor little Greece, now by the time of 1936, did not think of itself as a, an empire anymore, just thought of what is the best way to deal with this new modern world and how to shape what we have. It wasn't an expansionist uh, regime or country at that time, you know, the ideology at the time period. Although their neighbors were expansionists, the Bulgarians, the Italians, obviously the Germans, and the Turks. So we had a lot of enemies. And they had other ideas about what to do with our islands and with our um, uh, main, the, the mainland. We were in their way again for the Second World War, which has to do with oil and which has to do with, with past the Middle East and Axis. So, uh, the Texas family tree, uh, just like Venizelos, the Texas was from Byzantium, this family tree. Uh, Marcos Antonius of Texas was one of a noble advisor to Constantine XI, the last emperor, who survived the fall and moved to the town of Razzata in Catalonia, which was renamed by Texada. Kusadino Zotaxas was a revolutionary leader with Papa Ples in 1821. Andreas Zotaxas became prime minister in 1843. And, oh, sorry. Iwanis Zotaxas was given the reins to rule from King George II as prime minister and established the 4th of August regime in 1936. So, one of the art pieces I'm working on, my art book. Uh, this is the actual quote that Zotaxas said to the Italian um, ambassador Grazzi when he was awakened at uh, 3 in the morning. I think that's how it said. It's in French, that was the diplomatic uh, language of the time. So he didn't speak in Italian to him, he didn't speak to Greek, they spoke in French. Uh, and um, later on it became the popular oil that uh, the people went out uh, and uh, the invasion had begun. So the thing is, what he did was, that's why he was given the reins, uh, he rebuilt the infrastructure of the country. So it wasn't just people that went to fight and won a war. It was actually an actual uh, government that fixed from bottom up the country. The eight hour work, the social security, you know, roads, uh, all these things were filled under uh, the Metaxas uh, period. And this is what uh, Winston Churchill had said uh, about the war. Uh, here we will not say that Greeks fight like heroes, but that heroes fight like Greeks. Uh, Hitler himself, for the sake of historical truth, 
I must verify that only the Greeks of all the adversaries who confronted us fought with both courage and highest disregard of death. So what an accessory to do is keep Greece out of the war as, as, as long as possible. Because he knew with, with the dead, with uh, all, all the different enemies in the Bulgarian joining the war again, that we will be invaded and a lot of lives will be lost. So we had to be neutral, but realistically, everybody knew that they were with the British. But if they had said, we're going to join England, England immediately would probably have tossed them out and taken over most of Greece for bases to control the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, if he had joined Germany, because the king was pro German, and a lot of people feel he'll, he'll go with the Germans, um, there will be instant invasion and we will be under occupation. He very well knew that. And the reason I mentioned he was a Byzantine nobility, even though he was a monarchist, just like many other Greeks were monarchists, they also thought of the idea of Byzantium. And you know, although we didn't have a Greek monarchy, a real Greek one at that time was Germanic, you know, those two ideas kind of fused together. So it's a very complicated uh, you know, idea to, to, to fathom now. There were monarchists, there were people that were more progressive, like the Venezuelists, and in another section that was called the Republicans. So between all these ideas, when, when people analyze history, they try to simplify it with today's terminologies and things like that, which is not, you know, it's not right. It's kind of like a 30 year ideological, you know, uh, warfare that happened in Greece. That's why all these events happened. A lot of good things happened, but it also kept us divided. For this time period, it was kept intact long enough to build an infrastructure and to build the north of Greece, the Metaxas line with fortresses that remain to this day. These are the fortresses along with Fort Rupel to begin in 1913 that he knew we have to protect Northern Greece because the Germans, once they, the Bulgarians come in, they're gonna steamroll all the way down. And they had to you know, secretly uh, build a defensive system in the north of Greece. And always in Macedonia and Epiros, in those places, that's where a lot of our issues happen because it's a big landmass. And a lot of people that used to live in those lands also claimed, and um, we always have some, some kind of you know, issues with the North. But uh, the Germans, because of the Ocean of Green Empire now, they had, uh, after World War I, they had to pay a lot of money, and they felt like they were wrong because of the alliances that led to World War I. Uh, they felt that Austria Hungary had the right to invade, and therefore, why should we now suffer because we lost? They you know, had different opinion of how they're gonna, uh, you know, elect the Nazis. And Mussolini, who started in World War I, he led, you know, the, the fascist ideas. So they were bitter that they lost, and they grew, and the Greeks, and like the Serbs and other Balkan people, knew that they couldn't join on those sides because they would be taken over. It was ideologically incompatible. This is a little map of uh, the Italian invasion of Greece. So what we're trying to, um, I think it's good to understand that what this war brought out is Northern Epiros and Epiros, which was forgotten. It was a very important region of Greece. A lot of the benefactors from Epiros, from the region of the world was fought in the Pindos Mountains, uh, built modern Greece. Let's not forget that Epiros and Northern Epiros. And they seeked autonomy in 1914, they got it. After World War One, our, our vision of what Greece would be did not match, you know, England's and other countries, so we lost it. And by the time of World War Two, the issue of Northern Epirus came out again. There's like a million, you know, almost a million people that were there. And Aguilar uh, Castro, Koritza, Ayusarandes, all were Greek areas in what is now Southern Albania, or at the time. So as it was mentioned also earlier, the Italians did promote Albania as part of their territory. And they wanted to take away from Serbia and Greece as much as they can, just like the Bulgarians wanted to. So the North was very important to cement. So that's why staying out of the world was very, very important. So that's uh, simple map. That's an interesting uh, game with the line. This is kind of what saved Greece, because even after uh, we defeated um, Mussolini's forces, it, deep into what is Albania and Northern Epidos and farther up, uh, in the cold mountains of, of the Pindus in, in, in Albania and Northern Epidos, 
uh, after the Germans took over, the Nazis tried to steamroll down. They, they, they couldn't even take Greece. It took them almost half a year. And that is what this uh, fortification of the north stalled them. And then, of course, the Battle of Crete, another event that we don't forget. So a lot of us usually are like, we like, you know, World War One. we like reading about World War II, but when you try to figure out Greece's role in it, it's always, we're not that directly involved in it. I mean, we are, but our, our events always come before and after. That's why I think it's also a little bit confusing. And it's good to tie a lot of other things to understand that it's, it's all one. Like World War One starts between 1912 and 1922. World War II has other things that happen, but we were not the main, uh, after the Nazis invade, we were occupied, so we didn't have much of a role, which is resistance after that. But we had the Battle of Crete, which is very important. That actually delayed Germany until uh, the invasion of, as we know, the Soviet Union, which eventually led to its loss because they had to invade Russia in a winter. Just like Napoleon, you know, realized that it was a, it would fail. Um, and this is what I want to show you: the the castles of Ipiros in, the, in those areas, and the young kids. This is what kind of became popular: the music of Sofia Bembo, and a lot of the other artists of the of the time. They idealized Ipiros and other Greece, and that won the hearts of a lot of Greeks, and that's why they joined the struggle in the north. It's another traditional dress from Theropolis, uh, not the Nipros, I don't know if you've seen this, it's beautiful. Like the Eurocastro, what is now Southern Albania. So, so uh, Northern Nipros lost aut autonomy twice. And after World War II, basically it was given as an ultimatum to Greece. I, I kind of gathered it's uh, either you get the Deccanis or you get Northern Nipros. And they kind of forced them into getting the islands to solidify the Aegean, I guess, Father intrusions from the Turks down the line, and uh, we lost another Nipiros. Um, some more press from uh, from the war. Uh, Fort Wayne Journal, Gazette, the New Sentinel. These are from America, the New York Times. Italy invades Greece, starting Vulcan Drive. As Athens rejects a three-hour ultimatum, the Texas has Greeks to fight to the death. Zitoid was a total view. Sophia Bembu, one of the most famous singers and activists uh, for the cause. She was the voice. She used to, her songs, as uh, you always said uh, earlier, uh, were satirical about Mussolini. Uh, and uh, they were very popular with the troops. And uh, she gave a, a good portion also of her fortune to the cause in the war effort. Another famous Greek woman that uh, we should remember. Some of my works, I have the Hellenic History series of Porphyria, as mentioned, and then this stuff, uh, Byzantine theme music, other things. So that's my, uh, that's my presentation. Hopefully we'll get something a little bit out of it. Tonight. I have to mention a few things about the Texas. Uh, if it wasn't actually for Archibald, he, he may not have been the hero that some people talk about. He, he was a dictator, and um, and for those who are into culture, he also uh, messed up that abetiga, because you had that abetus at the time, and they had to go underground, quite frankly, uh, during his uh, period. He did die before, before obviously, the fighting started. He died in, in January uh, of 1941. So he, he didn't actually, he wasn't there during the whole sequence that we talked about in terms of the of the six month, the months. He had built the Metaxas line because, because he expected, he expected the invasion to take place, not from the Italians in the beginning through Albania, but he expected the invasion to take place uh, through Bulgaria, quite frankly. That's why he set up the Metaxas line. That's why he had a few battalions over there. And uh, the Italians themselves felt that, that uh, Bulgaria would enter into Greece uh, during that time period, and they didn't. So what that did was that freed up the troops actually to go into Epidus. And uh, you know, so that was, that was a great thing. The next person I'm gonna introduce is someone that, um, that I love quite frankly. I love everybody here, but I, but I, but I love her also. Um, we did uh, have a panel discussion last year together. Uh, we did it, uh, you know, since it was COVID, we, we have a webinar, anyone can see it on, uh, 
on, on YouTube. We did have also the, the Council General here, and uh, during that period, we also had a general from Greece, as well as the um, one of the people from the ministry relating to the Greeks abroad. And I, I thought it was a great, uh, it was a great presentation. Marsha has served as the museum director of Kehila, Kodesha, Yanana since uh, 2004, and she sits on the board of trustees of the synagogue and the museum. She is also on the board of directors of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, and has been the president of the Association of the Friends of, the Friends of Greek Jewelry since its foundation in 1997. As of uh, 2017, she has been working for the American Jewish Committee on the Cyprus team. She was born into a traditional Sephardic Jewish family from Salonika and, and has devoted her life to telling the story of Greek Jewelry as an author, a translator, an editor, and a lecturer. She has two BAs, one from Brooklyn College in Psychology and the second from Queens College in Byzantine History and Modern Greek Studies, plus two MAs, the first in psychiatric uh, uh, casework uh, from the new school, and the second in Italian from Queens College. In October 2017, she was honored by the Jewish uh, community of Yanina for her multifaceted, continuous work in support of the Jewish community of Yanina and the Jewish communities of Greece. It's important, it's important to note that um, we, we talked about hunger. Uh, we didn't talk too much about genocide. Uh, Billy, Billy discussed it uh, you know, uh, slightly. Uh, we don't know exactly how many people died during this period uh, between Orchide and let's say the, the, uh, the end of World War, uh, World War II. Uh, the figures are as high as uh, a million 100,000, uh, but certainly, uh, 800,000, 900,000 people uh, we know died, some from hunger, uh, some from uh, uh, various aspects of the occupation, and many died uh, during the genocide that took place uh, with the Hellenic Jews uh, of Greece, many of whom have been in Greece for thousands of years. They were not people who just came over, you know, uh, many times we talk about uh, you know what happened in 1492, etc., and how they went into the Ottoman Empire. But the reality is, the Greek Jews have been with us, and they are part of us for thousands of years. So, with that, I introduce Marsha for her presentation. Marsha will be speaking on "May Their Memory Be a Blessing." Greek Jews who fell in battle in the Albanian. So thank you for asking me to take part in this. I also want to mention, uh, as a little aside, very proud of my second alma mater at Queens College, and I want to know that all three of your presenters are graduates of Queens College, which has the best Greek program in the United States. I was honored to achieve the highest award in my graduating class. Of course, I took studying the language seriously, unlike many of my Greek American fellow students who thought they were going to get an easy A. I also have to mention uh, Jimmy disappeared, but Jimmy mentioned that his grandfather was involved in enabling Greek Jews to escape from Greece into Turkey. I wonder, Jimmy, if your grandfather knew my father. Because my oh, Peter. Peter, okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, I wonder if your grandfather, Peter, knew my grandfather, my father, because my father was at the receiving end in Turkey when those Greek Jews arrived. He was a member of Haganah, and he enabled those Jews to get onto what was then Palestine. It's a very small world we live in. Now for my presentation. By the way, you were concerned that you were late in the program and that people might discuss what you were going to talk about. I never had that concern. Okay. <laughs> this, is the, this is the map of Albania. 
I'm going to try to use my the border of Albania here. Um, my presentation today is going to be very centered. It's not going to be long. I have a purpose. <laughs> there are those people who know me that may question that. The Italians marched into Albania on their way to cross over the Greek border. They were well trained. They were sophisticated in ammunition, but they did not have the determination and the passion that the Greeks had. It's very easy to understand this. It was just not that long ago before Greece was released really from out of the Turkish occupation. Yanira became part of modern Greece in 1913. So 27 years later, there was the threat of being conquered by another country again. This is an eternal picture. It could be any mother. It could be a Greek Jewish mother. It could be a Greek Orthodox Christian mother. A mother sending her son off to fight in the war, not knowing if he would survive. The trenches were difficult. The terrain was rugged. It was mountainous. It was cold. There were times when snow was up to their waist. Greeks fought with less sophisticated weapons than the Italians had. The Italians had airplanes that could bomb. They had more sophisticated weaponry. Greeks were riding in on horses, cavalry. The Greek, according to the According to the archives of the Army History Directory, so that the beginning of the war on April, until April 28, 1941, when the Greek army surrendered to the Germans, who had invaded from the north, the Greek casualties on the Albanian front amounted to 14,000 officers and soldiers. Of the total of the dead in the operations against the Italians, 7,796 bodies remained in Albania, buried or not buried, while 5,960 were buried in cemeteries within Greek territory. In 2019, the remains of 193 Greek soldiers who died in Albania during the Greek-Italian War in 1940-41 were given a Greek Orthodox burial at the military cemetery uh, in the Albanian region of Premet. There were additional burials in other parts of Albania. I'm pointing this out because I got very much involved in what was supposed to be an identification of many of these buried Greeks, some of whom were Jews. Unfortunately, COVID set in because in 2019, they had set up the attempt to get DNA database so that they could identify some of those that were buried in unmarked graves. Now, Greek Jews were 1% of the total population of Greece in 1940, a population of about 7,500,000. Greek Jews were 76,000. The official figure for Greek Jews volunteering to fight on the Albanian front is about 13,000. Of those, 3,500 returned severely wounded, many amputees. 513 gave their lives for their country. What follows is their story, usually overlooked in the general story. Everybody, mostly everybody, knows the name of Mordecai Frizis, and justifiably so. He was a gallant colonel at the time that he perished on the Albanian front. There are statues all over Greece. One of the most beautiful is the equestrian statue in the island of his birth in Evia in the city of Kalkis done by a very lovely man named um, Stephanos Bekarius, who's a diner owner in Detroit, and who grew up, who grew up enamored of the courage of Mordecai Frazis, and went out and raised money to create this statue. I'm proud to say that we at Kalakadosiana were instrumental in also giving funds for this very important effort. Mordecai was born in January of 1883 in Kalkis, on the island of Evia, to a Romeo, Greek-speaking Jewish family. He was one of 12 children born to Jacob and Eobie Frizis. 
He fought in World War I on the Macedonian front, becoming a second lieutenant in 1919. In 1922, as a newly promoted first lieutenant, he took part in the Greco-Turkish War, 1919-1922. He was taken prisoner, and as the only non-Christian Greek officer taken prisoner by the Turks during the campaign, was offered his freedom, but refused and elected to remain with his comrades enduring 11 months of captivity. During World War II, Frizis, now a colonel, participated in the Greco-Italian War and succeeded in repelling an Italian attack on the bridge of the Thymus River, followed by a Greek counterattack. When the Italians counted with aerial bombing, his men dismounted and took cover in trenches, while he continued riding his horse throughout the battlefield and shouting courage to rally his men. He was severely wounded in the stomach but continued trying to rally his men. When the Italian aircraft withdrew, it was discovered that he had died of injury. In 2002, his remains were located in Albania and were transferred to the new Jewish cemetery of Thessaloniki. Officiating at the service was the then rabbi of Thessaloniki, named Mordecai Frisis. He was Mordecai Frisis' grandson. The Greek state has honored his memory by erecting busts of him at War Memorial Karpaki and Athens and in his birth town of Karkis, and has given his name to an Athens street. The grave of Mordecai Frisis is in the Jewish cemetery in Thessaloniki. This is the Cone Battalion from Salonika. There were so many Jews in Thessaloniki that volunteered to serve. This was one of those battalions. Isidore Levy from Thessaloniki was killed on November 22, 1940. I'm not gonna take you to Yana. I always say my roots are in Salonika, but my heart is in Yana. And if you haven't been to Yana, you've missed one of the most beautiful parts of Greece. I want to bring you back 81 years, because Yanina today is a very different city than it was in 1941, 1940. Yanina today has a major university, a teaching hospital, is an exciting cosmopolitan city with athletic events taking place on the iconic uh, lake there. 1940, this is what Yanina looked like. Little backwater town. The Jewish population there had dated back probably, we only have documentation, documentation to the 8th century, but probably even earlier. These were Roman Yoke Greek speaking Jews who led a simple life. They lived on small cobblestone streets. Their rabbis would walk comfortably through the streets, never feeling threatened. It was an excellent relationship between the Jews. And the, and the Greeks. Uh, actually, an interesting quote from uh, Ray Dalvin, who wrote the book, The Jews of Yanina. And she said, the Jews of Yanina used to say, keep us from the Jews of Salonika, the Turks of Arthur, and the Christians of Yanina. It wasn't said with animosity, because on a Christian holiday, the Jews were taught the Christians. On a Jewish holiday, the Christians were taught the Jews. They were too much alike. They shared similar places in society. Neither were very wealthy. And they got along very well. The scenes in 1940, the laundry reflected in the lake, a simple peddler, of just as a Jewish water carrier, imagine trying to teach your family under this occupation. You can still see these scenes now, especially the laundry reflected in the lake. I want to get very personal now. <clears throat> I want to give names. I want to bring these men out of obscurity and to the forefront of my presentation. Through research, we have been able to find the names of Greek Jews who perished on the Albanian front. The first Jew to perish would be uh, Joseph, Joseph Raphael. He perished at the age of 26. He was the son of a man who sold vegetables. 
Joseph would die on November 5th, 1940, only a week into the war. Tragedy came early to the small Jewish community of Yanda. Joseph's wife, Esther, was pregnant with their child. Esther, her daughter, Raquel, and Joseph's mother and father would perish in the Holocaust. His older brother, Raphael, survived the camps. Moses Shemos, <coughs> excuse me, was 24 when he died in November 26, 1940. His mother was a widow. Her other sons had gone to Athens to make a living. Moses was her sole support. Moses' mother, Fortune Fontuni, was deported on March 25, 1944 by the Germans and killed in Auschwitz on April 11, 1944. These photos that you're looking at are photos that were taken by a German paratrooper on the day of deportation of the Jews of Yana. They were part of the archives in Koblitz, and Kehillah Kedosh Yana shared the copyright for that. Now, the copyright is non-existent. January 11th, 1941, the small Jewish community of Yana, then numbering 2,000, would be one less. Shemos Aris was 31 when he died of his injuries on the Albanian front. He was the middle child, the middle son of Elias, and along with his brothers, Nisim and David, helped his father in a small textile shop. David Negan was 28 when he died on February 14, 1941. He and his family were dairymen. The son of the butcher Pizzarillo, Judah, was 25 when he fell in battle. The remains of Orio Negrin, son of Solomon the Merchant, have never been found. He has been listed as missing in action since November of 1940. One of the saddest stories of all was that of Nisa Mattis, severely injured at the age of 24. He would return to Yadda as an amputee, along with his widowed mother, Annette, his older brother Joseph, Joseph's wife Esther, and his younger brother Moses, he would be deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau and perish in the gas chamber. The injuries he incurred fighting for his country would make him father for the crematoria. The Germans considered him incapable of working. The primary criteria for surviving the selection at the train depot and at arrival at Auschwitz-Birkenau. His fate would be shared by other Jewish veterans of the Albanian Front. The mounds of prosthesis at the Museum of Auschwitz testimony to their unfortunate demise. May their memory be a blessing. Joseph Raphael, Moses Shemos, Shemos Addis, David Negrin, Judah Pizzarello, and Orio Negrin, Orio Negrin and Nisa Mattis. I'm going to send you out. I want you to do something important. If memory becomes lost, it diminishes, it disappears. We must never forget the sacrifices that were made on the Albanian front. All of you sitting here have relatives that probably fought. Probably many have relatives that perished. Bring to light their stories. Share them with your children. Pass them on so that their memory will always be a blessing and never be lost. Before I stop crying, I'm going to end. Thank you very much. I would, I would be remiss and not also mentioning, uh, you know, we talked about men who fought in in uh, during Rocky Day and uh, what transpired after Rocky Day. But one thing we did not touch on, and uh, we have touched on it in the past with regards to some of these uh, seminars, but we did not touch on the woman, on the woman who fought uh, during the war. It's, it's very difficult to explain to people what type of war uh, this was. This was a mountain warfare. And, uh, it was also during the winter. It gets very cold there with snow and all the rest of that. Uh, the woman, without the woman being there, I, 
I don't know if the men would have, would have done what they had to do. The women fought. The women, in many cases, used rocks, actually, during, during the battles. And we also have to remember, remember them. Uh, we, will, we will make sure, you know, in the future that we also cover uh, that particular base. I'd like to end our program today with Costas again singing for us this time, Patrida, Patrida. Διεύουν πόλεις και χωριά απ' τη Ρουμελίο στο βοριά πηδούνε και χορεύουν τον πένι το κοροϊδεύουν ο στρατός μας πάνω στα βουνά για τη λευτεριά μας ξαλυπνά με το όπλο η αφλογέρα τραγουδάει νύχτα μέρα Πατρίδα, πατρίδα, Ελλάδα δοξασμένη, κανείς δεν θα σ' αγγίξει τη γη την τιμημένη. Πατρίδα, πατρίδα, όλα τα παιδιά σου στα σύνορα πεθαίνουν για την ελευθερία σου. Καλύτερα μια ώρας ελεύθερη ζωή παρά σαράντα χρόνια σκλαβιά και φυλακή. Νύχτη νυμένη αστρολαμπερό με τον τσολιά της πλάι για γαπρό γελάει ευτυχισμένη η Ελλάδα η δοξασμένη δόξα με την νίκη θέναρθουν στην αγκαλιά της να αποκοιμηθούν από όλα τα παιδιά της πληγοτράγουδουν μπροστά της Πατρίδα, πατρίδα, Ελλάδα δοξασμένη, κανείς δεν θα σ' αγγίξει τη γη την τιμημένη. Πατρίδα, πατρίδα, όλα τα παιδιά σου στα σύνορα πεθαίνουν για την ελευθερία σου. Καλύτερα μια ώρας ελεύθερη ζωή παρά σαράντα χρόνια σκλάβια και φυλακή. Καλύτερα μια ώρα ελεύθερη ζωή παρά σαράντα χρόνια σκλάβια και φυλακή. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you to the, to the presenters. Um, let's not forget Orchidee. Or a lot of the days that that are should be embedded in our mind that is marching the day. We should teach our children never to forget. These things are important. Thank you. Ezito Yalas. Χρόνια πολλά για την ημέρα σήμερα. Νομίζω το μήνυμα τη σημερινή ημέρα μπορεί να περιοριστεί σε μία λέξη, σε μία πρόταση. Όταν οι Έλληνε είναι ενωμένοι, μπορούν να καταφέρουν τα πάντα. Ενότητα λοιπόν και μονιασμένη για να τραβήξουμε τη χώρα μας μπροστά. Χρόνια πολλά.